Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, Perfect Building Maintenance, m and Bank, Customers Bank, Marks Paneth LLP, Capital One Bank, Collins Building Services, Meridian Capital Group. Additional support has been provided by grants from AKA Hotel Residences Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, Amarant Bank, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, Chase Commercial Mortgage Lending, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Citizens Bank, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties LLC, Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Casamitidis Red Apple Group, Keysight Capital Partners, Matone Group, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Ocean First Bank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Services, Stonehenge NYC, SVN CPEX Real Estate Services, Tierra CRG, the Meringo Family Foundation, and these friends. Welcome to the second part of the Stoli Report on the office market. My guests today include Robert Lapidus, Eric Doral, Bill Elder, Stephen Siegel, and Bruce Mosler. Everybody's talking about co-working. Co-working spaces will continue, right? What do you, what's your thought about co-working in general, especially in today's market where people want to maybe have smaller offices in certain cases where they have the enterprise system? Thinking about, again, making a decision in the eye of the hurricane, we have to think about why did co-working come about? There was a lot of really good reasons for it to exist. The reasons for it to exist largely will still exist post this pandemic. Maybe we configured differently, maybe more enterprise model, maybe more partnerships with landlords. But at the end of the day, it's very expensive for people, particularly smaller tenants, to invest a lot of capital into their space. So the co-working concept, you know, is, is there and I think will continue to be here. You have to separate that from the capitalization of some of these, play, of these businesses. You know, was WeWork ever worth $47 billion? Come on, maybe Adam Newman thought that, but no one else did. So, so that's a valuation and a capital thing, not a use thing. So uh, listen, we, we have co-working tenants in our buildings. They all paid rent last month. You know, we'll see what happens next month. Um, but I do think that business model will have to change and evolve based on what ha- our needs are today. But I definitely think it's going to be part of the future in a different way. Co-working, I think, is is got a, a bit of a problem. I think, you know, flex office enterprise, there's definitely a place for that. I think the co-working is got to, you know, going to face some challenges. And when you look at the business model, uh, it's very difficult to uh, create a, a a model where you know distancing and a co-working, uh, you know the 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 economic go upside down. I think what you're looking you're talking about maybe returning more to like HQ or Regis models, which have more social distancing and private be, offices. And look, so. we saw before the uh, pandemic, we saw an incredible surge of activity of smaller space uses between kind of three and seven thousand feet in our portfolio to the point that we were starting to build more of it, and so I think. You know, we'll see if that demand returns, but, uh, you know, it will come back at some point. But I think we're going to see a lot of demand from kind of the, the co-work and flex office users that have some, you know, concerns about going back into some of those environments. Eric, um, you have, uh, I think, we work in one property in no tell. We don't have any we work. We, we work in a third-party building. Uh, we, have, we have two buildings that have no tell. I think one thing for them is 
if they would stop focusing on just sheer size to create this big IPO, they would actually run their business a lot, a lot better. I think they were so focused on size and so focused on just growth that they sort of lost, you know, took their eye off the ball, which I think was a mistake. I sort of think they offered a flexibility that I think the rest of us now are, are willing to offer in a lot of ways. I think what they offered, and we, the way we understood it, is we wanted traditional sort of long-term leases, which is what our, our lenders wanted, and the tenants didn't want that, and they found this gap in what we were willing to offer and what they could find. I think now a lot of us are willing to offer some of those things, so I think they're going to struggle a little bit as they compete you know, for what we're willing to, to accept for rent and what the hotels in the world are willing to accept for rent. So they're going to have to up their game in terms of the things that they offer. Sir, I think you're making a very good point, but I'm going to come back to what Rob said. I think the premise here, the business model, that they really espoused was something that was missing in, in terms of flexibility for the office occupiers. And and when it was rolled out, it was really richly embraced. And at the end of the day, that kind of term flexibility balance sheet, uh, if you will, reduction ability was, was critical. And to your point, Eric, maybe some landlords are willing to do that more so today, but they're not willing to do it on the scale that I think that corporates want. And to Bill's point about the co-working versus flex, that's going to sort its, uh, it will sort itself out. I do think co-working will exist, but I think it's going to have to adjust. And by the way, these are awfully smart people running these businesses right now, very creative. They're beginning already to think about how social distancing impacts the co-working component, but they were all gravitating to a larger model, I think, that really embraced flex space which is still out there. And, and I think there's enough demand for that, provided that they sort of sort out the desire to grow, to Eric's point, with where the demand really is. And that's gonna happen. Now, this cycle will push that to happen. Yeah. It's more the enterprise model and not 150 right. people at 150 decks and a coffee bar with 50 people gathered around it. It's more right. flexibility for the corporates that will yeah. exist. This pandemic, I'm not so sure the old co-working, tons of people with other amenities won't come back too. I don't know, but certainly in the near term, it's going to be more enterprise model. You, you mean the, the HQ Regis model, as opposed to what we had over there before? Well, well, well just the Mark enterprise Lodge model. The space taking big chunks of swing space for their corporate needs, as opposed to a small startup in this you know, bigger environment. Yeah, there we are corporations that took five-year oh deals God. funded by the co-working enterprise divisions, and that flexibility, Rob says and Bruce says, that still will be needed, and maybe more so going forward. That could be the reliever for the satellite office, right? I mean, that's that's where that might play into the. That's beginning to be thought about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. with regard to the satellite office, uh, Bill, your your colleague. Uh, Scott Reckler said there'd be more people going to the suburbs uh, for different operations, like in Brooklyn, uh, Westchester, New Jersey. Do you think that the companies will be operating partial part of their businesses in the suburban areas? We we do. Um, we're seeing it right now. As I as I say, with you know, companies are starting to sort through kind of the the, the real estate solution for the de-densification. What's going to happen? You know, pretty quickly. And so. Um, you know, having people that have easier commutes closer to home, uh, not the home office necessarily, but, you know, their own establishment somewhere in a suburb or a borough, uh, lower cost, to, you know, kind of evens out the, uh, the, the, you know, total real estate cost. I, it, it's, it's definitely happening now. We'll see if the trend continues and grows, but uh, we're definitely seeing, the, you know. Yeah, a, I, yeah, I we do have a number of tenants. It's important like to say that this is not a trend that we can determine whether this is a long-term one or short-term, to Bill's point, we are we are absolutely seeing a near-term for the next 12 to 18 months, largely driven by employers' care for their their folks' welfare and safety, not to have them get back on mass transportation immediately. We're seeing a near-term desire for some dispersion to, if you will, the suburbs. That's not clear that it's going to be long term at all at this point. Maybe there'll be a satellite component of it, but most of what I'm hearing is really it's a near term need to take care of the health and safety and welfare of their employees. Similar approach for 9 11, and eventually everyone consolidated back under That's one right. roof. But yes, there are tenants inquiring about redundancy yeah. locations, less density, not having to take mass transportation. But the one thing that's happened in this country the last 20 years is urbanization. 
People exactly. want to live, work, and play 100%. in cities. They don't want to be out on the lawn and walking around having their lunch and things like that. Millions of square feet is being committed to still now, right. in the midst of the pandemic, by the technological players, yep. because yep. the city is where they can get the workforce that they require to drive their business forward. Exactly. Right. And, that, and that trend, as Steve said, is a 20 year plus trend. And again, this horrible near term situation, I don't think changes what makes everything great about a city. Uh, and, so, and so I don't think it's going to have a major impact long term on people fleeing to the suburbs um, for all the reasons that I've articulated here before. Um, but short term, I think certainly. And for some businesses that want to have satellite operations, the lower cost of doing business out there. So it depends on your employees, right? If, you know, if I have 50 employees who live in, in, a, in one suburban area you know, and they're back office people, you can, you can make a really strong argument why you want to have satellite office there. But everything's great about the city, the connectivity, the vibrancy, for all, all, of the, all of the reasons that they're bringing here. I don't think that changes just because of this. Yeah, Bill, Bill said that Bruce and I lived through more cycles than him. But we had the cycles where people fled the city for a variety of reasons in the 70s. They fled them post 9-11 and they've all come back and they flourished. That maybe the, the face of the industry changed from the industrial to the service and so on. Technology now, as, as Bruce said, this is where the people who the employer wants to recruit and have work for them are, whether it's here, whether it's Atlanta, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, those cities will all recover and be occupied again. So here's a question with regard to commuter vans and so on. Since many people don't want to take the subway and they may be in Long Island City or other areas, do you see more companies coming with vans and other alternative means of transportation to get their employees? You know, I don't know. I, I think that falls in the category of too early to tell. I, I think, you know, from, from what we're hearing, the anxiety for, you know, a return to the workplace focuses more on uh, the transportation element to get into the city. Um, so Metro North and Long Island Railroad. And, you know, I think that those uh, those vans may fall into the same category. I, I don't know how comfortable people will be doing that. I, I don't know. We're looking at it. Um, but, uh, you know, you raise a good point as far as Sterrett, because we got to figure out, you know, that shuttle will come back at some point. I just don't know when the right time is. Um, and I think the broader distancing. issue, Michael, is, is um, how are the protocols going to work? We, 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 we are hearing um, things like staggered work starts. We're hearing things like protocols about how to get on and off of the subways. We're hearing things about which way to face. And again, increased cleaning protocols. I think those things have to go to work. We have to see how they work and people have to get comfortable. There is, it's gonna be a challenge, but time will tell. And, and I think most of this is gonna take um, a little bit of, of, of uh, more distance to unfold, but we can't get away from the fact that we have to have mass transportation. So it is about the protocols. It is about staggered starts. It is about increased cleaning to make the public feel at, as, as yeah. at ease as they can under very difficult circumstances. You know, when you talk about increased cleaning, somebody's gonna have to bear the expense. Mm -hmm. Is it the tenant's responsibility? Is it gonna be borne by the tenant and the landlord? We've had conversations with a lot of tenants, uh, you know, mostly in the larger category. And so, you know, the, the attitude seems to be, hey, progressive landlord, you've got the right approach here. You know, we've got a whole, you know, variety of things that are you know we're doing certainly not overkill but there's going to be some you know visible cues that will make people feel better like daytime cleaning uh as opposed to the nighttime nighttime cleaning and some temperature controls in, a, in lobbies and whatever we're going through a whole bunch of stuff but uh you know from from what i can gather so far the tenants are embracing the, the protocols we're putting into place and are certainly willing to bear the cost of the uh, you know the, the items and the and the services to you know make their employees and themselves feel uh, feel safe. We're all going to spend more money, right? We're, the landlords will spend more money on common areas and all that. Tenants are going to have different requirements. I'm sure in the new leases that you know Bruce and Steve will be negotiating, there might be a different base case cleaning that's you know you know more frequent and all that kind of stuff. But just like all the pain that's happening right now in the market, it has to get shared, right? The tenant can't pay the rent, hurts the landlord, hurts the lender, hurts
hurts the taxing, you know, you know, body. I'm very afraid of the tax situation in New York. You can't add trillions and trillions of dollars to a deficit. I'm, a, I'm afraid that the knee-jerk political reaction could be to just start taxing everyone. And that's already been a problem here in New York. And that's one of the things that just concerns me. But if you're making a decision as a business leader, you know, and you're sitting there saying, gee, I need to pay, I'll pay X percentage more to be in New York City. But when that percentage becomes so untenable, you know, what do you do about it? And I'm not sure what the answer is, um, but, you know, we haven't had great political leadership sort of dealing with that recently. So that's just a longer term concern that gets exacerbated by the situation. You know, we're saying everybody has to chip in. Have you gone to your banks? Okay, this is the owner's question. Gone to your banks and said, look, I need a deferral of payment of principal and interest. And how have they been reacting on that? So we haven't had to. Uh, and, you know, uh, ho hopefully we don't have to. So, um, you know, we've got pretty good visibility. And again, do you step back? And this is why, you know, it's, it's for a variety of reasons. But, um, you know, we try to focus on, you know, credit worthy tenants and, you know, every now we mix it up a little bit. You know, you got to get some creatives and certainly some retail that may not be as strong. But um, just given the profile of most of our assets, we're in a fortunate position that, uh, you know, I think we're going to make it through here. What we did is in the buildings where we had a lot of WeWork exposure as a percentage of the overall income on the property, we went to those lenders up front. And we said to them, hey, we don't know what's going to happen here, but we're letting you know that if something happens with their payment of rent, we're going to have to talk to you. So we just wanted to be in front of it. Fortunately, you know, so far we're, we're, we're good and we were paying. It wasn't an issue, but that's how we approached it. We're fairly low leveraged in our, in our portfolio, and it really has a lot to do with our partners. A lot of our sort of institutional partners pension funds and the like don't like paying like mortgage recording taxes in New York. And we probably own, you know, 3 million feet with no debt on it at all. So, so if you average it out, our, our leverage across our portfolio um, is more like a REIT than it is sort of an entrepreneurial owner. We'll, we'll, we'll take acquisition financing of 65% or so, or maybe 70 tops. But by the time the building stabilizes and we recapitalize it with that type of partner, we end up having a lot lower leverage. You know, when you go through a couple of cycles and you, you, you go through a tough time or what, a lot of people have made the decision to stay away from CMBS uh, financing because there's nobody to call. There's nobody, you know, and you know, we've all been to that game. And so when you go through the, you know, kind of country and you talk to people who've got a lot of apartment or hotel exposure, um, you know, they've been around a long time. And so they'll say, look, we stayed away from CMBS. We've got relationship lenders, right? Relationship lenders. And I think it's important to think about that as you go through this, because there is somebody to call uh, and you can have a, you know, a, a, a rational conversation um, as opposed to nobody home. We have zero CMBS loans in our portfolio. I know, Eric, you said to me every Monday, you and a group of nine landlords speak and discuss the world. What's happening to them with regard to the rent collection, with regard to discussions with banks, and so on? Yeah, so we, we sort of talk about the idea that, that we don't want to put any of the tenants out of business, but they can't collectively put us out of business. So it, it becomes difficult when the tenant attitude is, hey, we're all in this together, but you pay for it. And we're all sort of experiencing a lot of that stuff. So some of the guys are collecting the rent at a, at a sort of a lower rate than we are. Um, there are certain industries that are, that are definitely struggling. Fashion is one of them that's definitely struggling. So some of the garment guys are having a hard time. As far as the lenders go, we're in contact with all the lenders, um, Joe, just in case, because I don't know what the collections are always going to look like. I just want to be ready and be ahead of the curve in case I need some help from those guys. We, we, won't, we won't really need any help for the most part, maybe one or two buildings. We have one CMPS loan, which should be okay. Um, but I think there's a lot, of, you know, a lot of tenants out there that are struggling. But I think we should realize that we're all going to come out of this dented, but we shouldn't come out of this where we left somebody behind. Like, that's wrong. So and here's that's a hard. question with regard to something that I know that both Steve and Bill and uh, Bruce have been involved with, uh, and Rob has done it. He should have done it before at 425. It's the Midtown South rezoning. There are going to be hotels closing in Midtown South. There are other properties that are going to be changing over there. Do you see new construction being taken care of as a change from this effect? The fact that hotels or other businesses won't be there, so we can see new towers going up like what you're doing at the Grand Hyatt, Phil what Boston Properties is supposed to be doing on Madison Avenue. You see that as a, an opportunity for the future. 
Look, it's, it's possible, right? I mean, you know, we we entered into that arrangement long before the pandemic, um, but I I suppose there could be more opportunities now. Uh, you know, hotel the hotel business in, is in a real crisis right now, so you know, I, I think it's going to take a long time to kind of sort through that. I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities, um, you know, going forward. Not necessarily vulture, but maybe you know, uh, capital infusions or you know, mezzanine debt financing or you know. Uh, Joint venture equity, you know, who knows? But uh, I, it's 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 probable. It'll be a redevelopment, but demand will determine when and how. We are about to get an air rights deal closed for a landlord on Park Avenue, uh, and they've not slowed their uh, desire to have it and their uh, belief that they're going to redo this building in question. Uh, so there will be redevelopment, as you guys say, uh, of hotels vacant sites, whatever's left. But again, it's going to be what happens in New York as a whole. Do people come back the way we all believe? And will there be demand for more space? You know, the, the bigger hotel companies who are better capitalized probably have a better shot of withstanding this real terrible downturn. Um, those aren't the sites that are going to become available. And a lot of the smaller hotels that maybe would become available aren't really great sites for office development. So I'm not sure there's going to be this flurry of activity coming from that. But you know, the, the 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 seats at the table will change. Some of the retail is going to go out. Some of the hotels are going to go out. Some sites might be able to be put together, um, you know, to take advantage of of Midtown East rezoning. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure it's going to be a floodgate to that. One yeah. one of the high, highest revenue for the Empire State Building and plan for one Vanderbilt as well as the Hudson Yards property was the observation decks. What do you see that? I think the near term, you know, not not great. Long term, I think it'll be it'll be just fine. It'll return to the numbers that uh, uh, all those venues had prior, maybe more. We're talking, Michael, about the consumer here, right? At the end of the day, hotels will come back live again when the consumer is ready to consume when the tourist is ready to travel most critical point in time is the vaccine when we have that vaccine we'll understand better what the long-term normal looks like and i'm pretty optimistic but at the end of the day back to your question about you know east side rezoning i think that hotels that are part of this that that are in de in development in that cycle that are in the out years uh, I think they're going to be fine. In the here and now, to parse the question is, hotels and and restaurants and small business, which has been hit inordinately hard, right? Which is different than other down cycles we've seen. They're bearing the brunt of this right now. That's going to take time for consumer confidence to return. With regard to consumers, we've had a lot of food halls being built throughout the city. What do you see changing with regard to social distancing and so on? So I would say, going back to observation decks, there were there were discussions of more of them being built. Probably not having any more of them is a good thing. There was maybe too much supply of that coming. Maybe the food hall was the same thing, and the good food hall operators like Italy will do really well, but maybe some of the other ones shouldn't exist for other reasons. So all the things that we think about like in our city to sort of what's next and what's exciting and how we do it, there, there's, there's going to be an accelerant effect here that there's gonna be a whole band of new opportunities that come out of this, right? Think about the great financial crisis. Think of some of the companies that came out of that. The Ubers, the Airbnbs, the brain power that we have as, as human beings, particularly in New York City, which is the center of so much of this, will, will accelerate a lot of these things. So anyway, so to an answer that question, I think some of the food halls will go away, but I think food halls will be there because people are social. And people like the idea of getting different types of cuisine, but they have to be safe. And we've talked about a vaccine here all over the place. We need therapeutics. We need a vaccine. And we need a vaccine to be distributed to people. If you want to travel to Europe, I think you want to make sure the vaccine's there, too. And if people are coming in through JFK, you want to make sure they have it also. So it's a longer-term process to get the world sort of inoculated for this. But when that happens, you know, will be quote unquote back to whatever that new normal okay. is. Can I, can I ask a question? Who on this uh, panel gets the flu shot over here? I do. I do. I do. 
So, you yeah. know, there's somewhere between 30,000 and 50,000 people die every year from the flu in the United States, not yep. worldwide. And that's the new normal. Any, I mean, I don't know how many hundred years ago, 50 million people died over a two year period from the great influenza. The same protocols that were released by Amherst College in 1918, how to protect yourself from that flu, is exactly what we're seeing today. Frequent wash your hands, social distancing. It's an amazing thing. I'll send it around to you guys. But the point I'm making is with the vaccine, as Bruce and Robert said, we will return to a new normal. People will get their shot. Every fall, there will be X number of cases, regardless of what vaccine there is. Some people will not will not be susceptible to the right vaccine or the flu shot that's out there, and they'll get sick anyway. <clears throat> but there'll be less people. It'll be under a controlled basis. For me, it'll be interesting to see the numbers of, for these uh, states that have opened up already a little bit, Georgia, okay. et cetera. And see, and see Florida is now opening restaurants as of Friday. Was you know a low percentage of occupancy and so on. Really anxious to see two weeks from now what the cases are. In in conclusion, 19 years ago, Steve Siegel and Bruce Mosler were on one of my first shows from Charlotte's Kosher Restaurant in January of 2002, talking about will we come to bat, will we survive, and where will we be? We've survived, we've done well, and we will grow. I'd like to thank Bill Elder, Eric Corral. Rob Lapidus, Bruce Mosler, Steve Siegel, the AmTrust title, Steve Napolitano, Senior Executive Vice President, and the Stoller Report for bringing this today, and see you again.